Hi everybody, it's Sam. I'm going to read you chapter 15 of Twilight Hunger. Sorry I didn't do it yesterday, but I was so busy and everything. Oh no. Chapter 15. Morgan walked wryly down the carving wooden staircase hidden beneath her floorboards, placing her feet slowly, cautiously, shifting her weight gradually. The stairs groaned in protest as if they could give way at some at any moment, but they didn't, and she managed to make her way to the bottom. She found herself in a dark, dank, dark room, basement, one that didn't exist, according to every record on the place. God knew she had gone over blueprints and plans and age-old titles during the remodeling. She tried her damnedest to restore the house to its original appearance. She had learned the colors of the decor. In several of the rooms, there had been a sketch of the chandelier and an aging photo of the gardens in back, but nowhere had there been in mention of a cellar. In fact, the lack of one was mentioned more than once in those documents. Almost apolog apologetically, as if it were an inexcusable oversight on the part of the builder, the builder Daniel Taylor. Daniel Taylor is one of many aliases the vampire Dante has used. All hell. Taking a breath of still air that had never seen sunlight, Morgan flicked her flashlight on, moved its beam around. Wooden beams crossed the low ceiling above her head. The walls were built of flat stones piled on top of each other. She didn't know how the hell they stayed upright. An arching opening stood at the far end of the smallish room and she went to toward it shining her light no spider webs she found it odd that there were no spider webs sticking to her face as she tiptoed barely breathing over the dirt floor she moved closer and finally stepped through the archway into the smaller even darker room this one made of concrete the beam of her light arched around it to the left, falling on a small table, a kerosene lantern, a book of matches. She could smell the fuel. The lantern's glow was clean. Blinking, she made her way to the lantern and then anchoring, anchoring her flashlight under one arm to keep its beam where she wanted it. She found the lever that lifted the lantern's globe, struck a match, and touched it to the wick. As she lowered the globe into place and adjusted the flame, soft yellow light filled the room. It was such an incredible relief to have more helpful source of light that she sighed as she turned to see what the place looked like now that she could see. On the far side of the room, on a platform that kept it raised off the floor, was a box made of time-dulled wood. So dark it seemed black with tarnished silver handles on the sides. She stood there staring at it, her mind refusing to process the information her eyes were sending for the drawn out spaces between her two heartbeats. Then her mind whispered the truth to her, a coffin, and a scream ran in terror from her th lungs, bouncing off the walls and diving back into her own ears to hide. She bit her lip to, to silence herself and fought to catch her breath, as her heart galloped, the coffin's lid was closed. It looked old. How long had this been thing been down here? God, what was inside? Her mind wanted to know. It told her body to move closer, touch the wood, open the lid, didn't see. Him, Dante. The rest of her wanted to run. Every cell, every muscle tingled and twitched with the urge to turn and flee from this place, but her body refused to do either. Her legs were trembling so hard she could barely stand on them. Stress tended to do her in as quickly as physical overexertion, and today she had experienced both in levels beyond what she had been capable of withstanding for over a year now. It's not real. This is another of those vivid dreams, that's all. But no, in her dreams she was always strong, vital, bursting with energy, and she never felt fear. In the dreams he loved her. God, how God could the scarred man have been right? Could those journals be real? Could her Dante be lying right here in this casket, perfectly preserved, immortal, and dead? Maybe not, she muttered. Maybe 
maybe he just had himself securely buried here. Maybe that's all this is. The hundred-year-old rotting corpse of a wealthy, eccentric lunatic is probably all that's in that box. Just bones by now, that's all. And when she saw it, when she saw the proof that Dante had been an ordinary man with a vivid imagination and a gift for writing, maybe that would be enough to break the spell he had cast on her. Maybe she could free herself from of the sticky web her own obsession had spun to entrap her. Catching her breath, she forced her feet to move closer, one step, then another. She wasn't even sure she could bring herself to open the lid when she got to it. Then again, it might be sealed. It should be sealed, shouldn't it? They didn't just toss bodies into boxes and leave them unlocked. Then again, they didn't usually hide from hide them underneath houses either. She was at the coffin now. She told her hands to rise. They did, though she was almost surprised to see them obey. She lowered her hands gently to the coffin. It was cold to the touch, and a layer of groin lay between the smooth wood and her palms. Drawing a breath, she told herself to open the lid. Don't, this single word came in a deep, rich, hauntingly familiar voice from behind her. Morgan froze at the command and her closed her eyes. He had entered silently. She hadn't heard a sound, not a footstep, nothing. Let it be, Morgan. There's nothing in there that you need to see. Eyes still closed, she whispered, Dante. I, the voice hesitated, and Morgan opened her eyes and knew that his next words would be lies. She knew it was, she knew it as surely as if she were the one about to speak them, making them up as she went along. She felt them, she felt him groping, searching his mind for a convincing lie. Yes, I am Dante, but not the one of, not the one you think I am. He's my great-grandfather, and he is buried here, she said, his next line for him. It was his last wish. She nodded, and why are you here? To see you, he paused, breath, breathed, and she felt him searching and spinning. That film of yours is so like the old man's delusions that when I learned you were living in the house he had built, I knew you had learned of his fantas fantasies somehow and used them to create the script. She didn't turn to face him. She couldn't, not yet. You're saying they're not real. He forced a laugh, just a breath, really. It was the most false thing she had ever heard. Of course they're not real. And you, you came inside my house without knocking? I was about to knock when I heard you scream from outside. Of course, and yet you set off no alarms when you came in. He didn't speak. Morgan swallowed, and in one swift act of will, she pushed on upward on the lid. The coffin lay empty. White satin lining beginning to yellow with age. The lid stayed up when she let go and turned slowly to look at the face of her fantasy lover for the first time. He stood there dressed in black trousers and a black, black silk shirt buttoned all the way to the collar. No jacket, no tie. He was dark, everything about him dark, empty, hollow. His face was just as sculpted as she had imagined it. The hollows of his cheeks, the endless deep wells of his ebony eyes, he took her breath away because she loved him, because she was bound to him in ways she didn't even understand, because he was so exactly as she had known he would be, familiar, beloved, he was hers. You're real, she whispered. He stared back at her in silence. She felt him then stilling into her mind, felt him planting the certainty that this was just another of her dreams, willing her to believe it. She opened her eyes wide, shook her head. Stop it. You're not a dream. I won't believe you are. How can you be so sure? I'm, it's no use, Dante. Even if you could do whatever it is you do to my mind, the broken floor lords, this room, they'll all still be here when I wake. Even you couldn't make it all go away in time before sunrise. He studied her, he studied her, her eyes probing and narrow. You're... Either very brave or very foolish, Morgan. Don't you know how angry you've made me? I should kill you for what you have done. Then do it. She saw She saw the shock ripple through him. She didn't let it stop her. Her hands went to the high collar of her nightgown, and she ripped it open, popping buttons all the way to her waist. She tipped her head back, closed her eyes. Do it, Dante. Her pulse beat in reaction to the touch of his eyes on her throat. She felt him shiver, felt her own heat rise. She wanted something she couldn't name, a little, as little sense as it made. 
She knew she was dying anyway, and soon, judging by her symptoms of late, if she had to die, why not in the way he had described so ironically in his journals, the way she had experienced so vividly, if only slightly? Why couldn't she die in utter ecstasy as her essence flowed into him? And suddenly he was there, his arms tight around her, pulling her body hard against his as he bent over her. His mouth closed on her throat and she whispered yes. He bit down without breaking through and suckled her skin. She arched her hips against him, felt the arousal press it, pressing back. Morgan had never felt su such fire burn in her body as she did then. Her hands tingled, tangled in his hair as she twisted and writhed in his powerful arms, pressing her body closer, arching her throat to his hungry mouth, she felt his lips warm and wet on her skin, his tongue stroking and tasting the delicious pinch of his teeth biting down just a little. And then suddenly he wrenched himself away from her so violently that she, just, that she stumbled and fell to the packed earth floor. Breathless, she remained there, knees bent awkward, arms braced on the floor behind her as she stared at him, his at his eyes gleaming now with an odd luminescence that didn't seem to come from the glow of the kerosene lamp, at his face drawn tight in some kind of unnamed anguish. You have no idea what the hell you're playing with, Morgan, he said, his voice stern and coarse and steady. I know, she said. Her words came life less forcefully than she would have liked. Her chest moved rapidly as she fought for the breath in between. I know you better than anyone ever has, Dante, or ever will. He went very still, his eyes narrowing on her. How? She closed her eyes, let her head fall backward, then her arms bent, and she was lying on the floor. God, she was so weak suddenly, it was all too much. He swore softly and bent to gather her up on, into his arms. He carried her out of the place, up the rickety stairs, and managed to get up through the jagged hall on the floor. Are you hurt? He asked the question almost reluctantly as he as he took her through the house, obviously knowing his way around. No, but you are ill, he said unnecessarily. She nodded, resting her head against his chest. You're changing the subject, am I? They were in the hall now, They were where he turned and carried her unerringly to her bedroom, to the bed. Then he lowered her onto it, but when he would have straight, strengthened away, she locked her arms around his neck and held on. You want to know how I know the truth? How I know about you? Leaning over her, one knee on the bed, his face only inches from hers, he nodded. I have to know. Then make love to me, Dante, and I'll tell you. His eyes flared hotter as he stared into hers. I cannot do that, Morgan. You are too weak. Not for that. Never for that. She lifted her head from the pillows, using them as leverage, he, and pressed her lips to his. Please, groaning softly, he returned the kiss, folding his arms beneath her and lifting her upper body to his chest. His tongue traced her lips, and when she parted them, slipped inside to taste her. her his breaths came harder, faster, and he slid his mouth from hers to, her, to trace her jawline down her to her neck and kiss her there where had he had before let her go let her fall I can't you have before you have I know it was real it wasn't a dream damn it Dante you've been with me night after night it wasn't real it was in your mind in my mind it wasn't real then make it real his muscles were so tense he was shaking and his jaw was rigid then he glanced toward the window, and she followed his gaze and realized that dawn was at hand. Tell no one what you have seen tonight. I swear to you, Morgan, if you breathe a word, you will die. Do you understand? I have no choice in the matter. Do you really think I would betray you? My God, Dante, I would never. You already have. She blinked and realized he was referring to the film. It's not the way you think it is. You've told my secrets to the world, Morgan. Some of my dearest friends have died because of what you have revealed about me and my kind in your films. I am being hunted 
because of you. My every step hounded by the man you met earlier tonight. She felt her eyes widened. I didn't know. I never would have told your stories, Dante, if I had known they were real. You have to believe that. He got his heels, went to the window. I have to leave. She surged from the bed, weak, nearly exhausted, and clutched at the back of his shirt. Then come back, Dante. Promise you'll come back. Come to me tonight. I'll tell you everything, I swear. He glanced back at her. Or maybe you have... Or maybe you'll have the scarred man here waiting when I arrive. I would, I would let him kill me first. She dropped to her knees, suddenly too weak to stand. Her head falling forward. She drew a shallow breath. I would die, Dante, before I would betray you. It was a string of words floating on a breath of mere exhaustion. Not even a whisper. Words I've heard before, Morgan. Dante knelt, clutched her shoulders, lifted her chin to her face. To search her face. When then he folded her to his chest, held her there with one hand, and took something from his pocket with one hand, pocket with the other. She saw it shine as it flicked open. A small pointed blade like a leather punch. He drew it to his own throat and jabbed it in, grunting in pain as he did. Morgan gasped, her eyes fixed on his corded neck as he drew the blade away and a scarlet strand of blood unwound from the puncture wound drawing over her skin. She licked her lips. The scent of it touched her nostrils, and a feral lust twisted her in her gut. His hand was on her hair, at the back of her head, pulling her closer, but she didn't need it. She knew what she needed. She buried her face in the crook of his neck, closed her mouth over the wound, and sucked the blood from his body. She drew on the opening, her tongue darting to catch any droplets that escaped her hungry lips. She laughed at him there until he pulled her away, pressing one hand to the wound in his throat. For one insane moment, she fought him, pressing closer, clawing at his hands, trying to steal more of this drug she craved. She could have ripped his throat open with her own teeth in that moment like a wolf. She would have killed him. He held her off easily enough. But when she looked into his face, she saw the same bared teeth, the same breathless hunger, the same feral gleam that lit his eyes. My God, he wanted to devour her in exactly the same way, like an animal, like a predator. He flung her toward the bed, lunged out into the balcony, and vanished over the, over the side. Morgan lay where she had landed, half on the bed, half off, panting. Her body was alive, tingling, her heart beating loudly and strongly. She didn't feel weak anymore. She felt alive, more alive than she had in years. Then she realized must be a glimmer of what it felt like to be to be what Dante was, to be a vampire. She wanted it suddenly. She wanted it with everything in her. She wanted to be a vampire, and she wondered if she would be now, if drinking his blood would make her what he was. Dante made his way to the house. Serafina had told him about. With all due haste, she, he found her there, pacing, waiting for him, but he only muttered a tear greeting before moving past her into the basement. She had tossed some blankets onto a pair of crates to make do. She was on his heels instantly, of course. Where have you been? What kept you, Dante? Jesus, is that your blood I smell? A minor accident. There's no such thing. She gripped his shoulders to stop him, but he kept moving away. Climbing into the box, she prepared for him, pulling the lid over himself. She caught the lid in her hands to prevent him from covering himself fully and ranted on. You know ex you know how easily we can bleed out, Dante? What the hell happened to make you so careless? I had a run-in with our scar-faced vampire hunter, he told her. Because if she ever knew the truth, he she would explode. And nothing, not even her bond to their kind, would protect Morgan from Seraphina's wrath. She was incredibly possessive, not only with the slave she kept, but of him. Um, I kind of lost my place in a minute. He was her only family. That meant a great deal to Serafina. The scarred man. He's in town? Yes, so be careful. Dante gave the cover another tug. The sooner I sleep, the sooner the rejuvenation process can heal my wound, Serafina. Sighing, obviously filled with, still filled with questions, Serafina secured the lid over him. He found the latches that had been affixed to hook from the inside, and he hooked them. Then he listened while Serafina made her bedtime preparations and climbed into her own box. 
He lay there very still, closed his eyes, waiting sleep. It was a long time in coming, though. Even when it did finally sweep over him, he couldn't stop the images from playing through his mind. Images of him and Morgan naked, or naked intertwined, his body buried into the hilt and hers, his teeth sinking into her flesh into her flesh, her body, her blood flowing into his body. God, he wanted her. He wanted to possess every part of her, her soul, her flesh, her blood. And he knew it would be worse now. She had drunk from him not once but twice. He had tasted her, and he knew damned well that he would do it again if he wasn't careful. He, If he made love to her, he would drink from her, drain her maybe. He wouldn't be able to stop himself. And in her weakened state, he would kill her. He would kill her. God, he didn't want to kill Morgan de Silva. He wanted he wanted to love her. Too bad he was incapable of loving anyone at all. Chapter 16. Maxine and Lou were sitting in the hospital waiting room where they'd been sitting for the past four hours. It was daylight now. Stormy's parents had been notified and finally taken into a private room to await word. None had come. None whatsoever. It was a cruelest form of torture Lou could think of. The CIA ought to use it, just to refuse to tell some parents how their wounded child was doing until they gave up every secret in their possession. Hell, it would work every time. I've got to get a, get a hold of Jason, Jason Beck, Max, Max said. He would want to know. Lou didn't like seeing his normally spunky Max this way. She was pale and shaken, like someone had hit her. Her smacked between the eyes with a freaking two-by-four. And no wonder. He remembered the kid she referred to. He had been the third part of their incredible trio all through high school and college. Do you know where to find him? She shook her head slowly, stayed for a long time. Then finally she spoke again. It's probably just as well, she said. And it took Lou a moment to realize she was still talking about Jason Beck. He wondered vaguely how she managed to lose touch with someone she had been so close to, but time passed. Crap happens. Why did you? Why do you say that? Come on, Lou. You know what this is all. What this is about as well as I do. They found out what I told you. What I knew about DPI. He averted his eyes. It's the only thing that makes sense. They kill Stormy and frame you. It's a message to me, a lesson for me. It serves to make sure I won't ever tell anyone else. They destroy two people I care about. Just like that Styles guy told me he would. The question is, how does he know I told you? Lou licked his lips, lifted his gaze to her slowly. I made a call last night. She went very still, didn't say anything. I just, stare just stared at him, begging him with her eyes not to tell her what she had known. He was going to tell her to the friend of mine who work works for the CIA. I asked him to find out what he could about DPI. I told him I expected that her, they'd been running some kind of covert op out of White Plains until the HQ burned five years ago. I didn't mention you or the man you saw. You didn't have to. She swallowed hard. I asked you not to talk to anyone, Lou. How could you do this to me? Hey, Max, come on. I had no reason to think it would be resulting in anything like this. No reason. You had one reason. You had my word. I told you they threatened my friends and my mother. And you went right ahead and she stopped there. Oh, God. Oh, God. My mother. She was on her feet and heading for a payphone before Luke could stop her. He leaned back in his vinyl seat, pushed a hand through his hair. She was right. She was dead right if it had been another cop asking him to keep quiet about something like this. He would have taken them at their word and done it, but he'd underestimated Max. Mad Max, the conspiracy theorist, always sensing tr seeing trouble where there wasn't any. Well, hell, maybe for once she wasn't so far off base. There was a dull ping. The elevator door s off, the le off to the left side slid open, and Lydia came hurrying from them, eyes wide, wide. What happened? Lou, are you okay? Where's Max? God, is it Max? No, no, she's fine. I'm fine. Was He was on his feet and met Lydia halfway, hugged her and good and hard. I woke up this morning and no one was at Max's, so I called your place and got some cop who told me 
I could find you both at the hospital. Jesus, Lou, I'm scared half out of my mind. She looked it, he thought, stepping back a little. Her hair was a mess, no makeup. She looked her age for a change, which was kind of refreshing, but totally unlike her. Then she lost interest in him completely when she saw Max coming up, coming back from the payphone. Lydia walked up to the kid and hugged her as if they'd been friends for a long, long time instead of only a few days. Honey, you look like hell. I feel it. How's your mother, Max? Lou asked. Fine, maybe she's safe down there. Maybe they don't know where she is, or maybe they don't have the manpower to be down there and up here at the same time. Or maybe there's only the one man I, the one I saw. Maybe he's, maybe it's just him working alone. She pushed a hand through her head, through her hair. Sorry. God, I don't even know what we're dealing with here. I don't know who to be more afraid of, the vampires or the vampire hunters. Lydia let her go and stepped back, staring at her. Lou looked up and down the hall to be sure that the remark hadn't been overheard. Keep it down, will you? Someone will show up waving a one-way ticket to the mental ward with your name on it if you keep this up. She glared at him. Will someone please tell me what's happened? It's my friend Stormy, my parents, my partner in the business. She was found at Lou's place with a bullet in her head. They left her for dead, but she wasn't quite. They trashed Lou's place and they used his gun. They tried to set it up to look like he'd done it. My God, her gaze shot to lose, but then she turned it in inward. Wait a minute, Stormy. There was a message on your machine from someone named Stormy this morning when I got up. I saw the light, thought it might have been something from, from you, letting me know where you were, so I played it. I never looked at the machine when I got in last night. Max gripped Lydia's hand. What did she, what did she say? Glancing around her, Lydia lowered her voice. She said she had a, an odd call from Lou asking her to come to his place, that she wanted to let you know in case he was in trouble. She sounded funny. He gave her head a shake. I think that was all, but it was, but it's still on, your, on the tape in your machine. That machine records the minute the call comes in. Do you remember what it was? Around 9 p.m., Lydia said. She nodded. It wasn't Lou. Lou was with me seeing a movie and then sitting outside watching my place. Someone called her, lured her over there, and met her at the door with a two twenty-two. Thank God it was a twenty-two. Lou put in. Anything bigger would have killed her. But why? Why would anyone want to do that, Lydia baffled. It has to do with Max bro broke off as a doctor finally emerged from the room where Stormy was being treated. At the same moment, a nurse came from the private waiting room with Stormy's parents behind her. Everyone crowded together in the center of the waiting area. She's alive, the doctor said, but she's in a coma. Stormy's father, a blonde man who, who's normally healthy tan, seemed to have turned it to gray, lifted his head, met the doctor's eyes. Is she brain dead, doctor? Just tell us the truth. No, she has brain wave activity. It's minimal, but it's there. How long will she be in the coma? Max asked. Max asked, stepping forward, clasping Mrs. Jones' hand. I mean, a day, a week. We have no way of knowing when or even if she'll come out of the coma, the doctor said. But as long as she has brainwave acti activity, there's hope. They all waited for him to say more. Lou knew what they wanted to hear. Exactly how much hope. Exactly what are the chances... And when would they know anything more for certain? He could see the doctor's weary face that he didn't have any answers to give them. Signing the doctor led them all to chairs, urging them to set, set opposite them. Look, there have been cases where a coma has lasted months, even years. Sometimes they wake up, sometimes they don't. The longer she stays comatose, the lower her chances of recovery will be. But there have been cases where people woke after... Extended comas to make nearly full recoveries. There's just no way to know. And what about when she does wake up? Mrs. Jones asked. Will there be brain damage? We can't even begin to tell until she does wake up, ma'am. Again, though, the sooner she regains consciousness, the better. She'll wake up, Max said. She said, she said it to the doctor, and then she said it again to Storm's parents. She will wake up, and she will be fine. They say comatose people can hear you talking to them. Is that true, doctor? He nods. 
He nodded. In some cases, I've seen reactions in the EEG readouts when loved ones speak to comatose patients. Then that's what we should do, Max said in typical Maxine. Take charge, Stuart fashion. I think someone should be in there with her at all time, talking to her. And if no one can be there... We can have tapes of our voices playing or music. I know all her favorite music. Nothing slow, though. I mean, we want something hardcore and powerful, like God smack banging in there. We won't let her slip away. We just won't let her. Some of those might be very good ideas, the doctor said. Keep in mind, you'll have to give her a chance to rest in between. If she wants to rest, she can damn well wake up. Maxine's eyes were brimming with tears. Mrs. Jones cupped a hand to Max's face. You're a good girl, Maxine, a good friend. Then the woman looked past her at Lou and lowered her eyes. You need to know, Mrs. Jones, that Lou was at my place last night. I wasn't lying when I told you that. You know how much I love Stormy. I wouldn't lie to you about this. Someone set him up. Mrs. Jones nodded. We've known Officer Malone a long time, her husband said. It would take a lot more than what we've been told so far to make us believe him capable of anything like this. I appreciate that, Lou told the man, and I swear to you, I'm going to do everything I can to find the SOB who did this to your daughter and put him away for a long, long time. Yeah, and so am I. Maxine sent Lou a look when she said that, and he knew what it meant. They were going to do this her way from now on. With his help or without it, Maxine was going to track down the screenwriter that pumped her for it and pump her for information about God. He could hardly think about it without smirking vampires. And when he glanced at Lydia, Lou knew she was going to be attached to Max at the hip until they got answers. She wanted this was not even close to what he had, he had hoped to accomplish by bringing the two women together, not by a long shot. In fact, his entire goal had been derailed by all this nonsense. He had fully expected Max to reassure Lydia that there were no such things as vampires and in that part of the entire arrangement. After that, there they were supposed to get to know each other as friends and maybe later make a few discoveries on their own. These same discoveries he made himself entirely by accident. It was all blown to hell now, Christ. She may need another blood transfusion, Mrs. Blood transfusion, Mrs. Jones, the doctor said, and as soon she started to get to her feet. He held up a hand. No, ma'am, you can't donate any more today. We have supplies, don't worry. I prefer to know the source, the woman said. I know I know the blood supply is safer than ever, but still, I'm a positive, Max C. said. Me too, Lydia put in. The doctor sh shook his head. No, not what we need for her, though. You're welcome to donate anyway. Anyone for a negative? Lou raised his hand like a school kid. You're elected. The doctor sent Lou off with a nurse, and he thought it pretty ironic that he was entering the notion that vampires might be real even as he let some pretty young thing drain a, drain a pint from his veins. Can we see her? Stormy mother, Stormy's mother asked. The doctor nodded. Absolutely. He led the two parents away, and Max... Noticed with a wrenching ache in her belly the way Mr. Jones held his wife close to his side, all but holding her up, like he was loathing, loaning some of his strength to her. She sighed and turned to Lydia. We need to talk. You poor thing, Lydia hugged her again. I know what you're going through. When Kimber died, I just... She was more to you than, ju than a best friend, though, wasn't she? Lydia looked at her for a moment, smiled gently, sadly. Am I that obvious? I saw the photo you have in your wallet when you opened it the other day. The two of you, arm in arm, the way you were looking at her. I loved her, Lydia said softly. She was my whole life, and even though it's not the same, I could see you love Stormy. I could see the hurt in your eyes. God, it's like looking into a mirror a few weeks ago. Max swiped at her eyes. We don't have time for a pity party here. We need to get our story straight about last night, and then we need to get rid of that tape in... The answering machine. Lydia frowned at her. Get our story straight. Lou sat in his car outside my place all night long. Max told her. Lydia nodded in agreement. Right. I remember when you spotted him out there. I thought he. I thought it was real sweet of him. 
Exactly. So that two of us, so that's two of us who can swear that Lou never left our sight, except that he did. That he said softly. Remember after he dropped. Go away. Go away. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, <laughs> he dropped you. Drop. He dropped you. He took off for a while. He was back in no time. But yeah, and the darn damn fool told them so. Max licked his, her lips. I had to think fast, so I said that when Lou left, I followed him. Made up some line about suspecting he was seeing some other woman and being jealous. I confirmed what he told them, that he had gone to the station and had come straight back to my place. Lydia nodded slowly. I didn't know you when Lou were. We aren't. So you lied to the police? I know he didn't do this. You know it, too. Lydia turned away, drew a deep breath, finally blew it out with a sigh. Of course I know it. She turned to face Max again. I was there, after all, when you left to go follow him. I tried to tell you Lou was a one-woman man, but you just had to make sure. Max bit her lip. You could have been sleeping upstairs. You could have no knowledge one way or the other. Two witnesses are better than one. Especially if they think that one is the suspect's lover, Maxine. Max nodded. Thank you. No need. I like Lou. We've been friends a long time. He doesn't know I made it up. He would never let me do it. Understood, Lydia said. You mentioned the answering machine. Yeah, we need, to, we need to erase the message. Then she shook her head. But there might be a clue in it. I should find a way to co keep a copy. We could just put it in a new tape, Lydia suggested. It's not on tape. It stores the messages electronically. But a new machine? Buy a new machine, Lydia said. Take the old one and stash it somewhere safe. Maxine not Max nodded slowly. It's a good plan. Later, I can transfer the message to tape and destroy the machine just for good measure. But for now, the fastest solution, and we have to get it done before they, they decide to search my place. I'll take care of it. Stay here. See your friend. Max nodded. Use cash and buy it someplace busy like Walmart where they won't remember you and don't make your appearance too memorable. M biting her lip, Lydia frowned hard at her. Just what are we dealing with here, hun? The government, a part of the CIA, I think. A secret part that might not even exist anymore, but the man who shot Stormy was part of it. Lydia nodded slowly. You called them vampire hunters. That's exactly what they are. Maybe still are, she sighed. Look, I'll tell you everything I know, but you can't mention it to a soul. That's what got Stormy shot. Okay, understood, but not now. This isn't the time or the place. I'll go take care of that machine of yours and we'll talk later. May I may as well meet up at the police station, Max said. They're going to want sworn statements from all of us. Noon, Lydia said. Noon's good. See you then. After Lydia left, Max waited around till Lou finally returned from donating blood with a bandage on his arm. He looked at her as if checking her over, like he was searching for signs as to how she was holding up. <sighs> And while her independent woman side thought it was hopelessly old-fashioned of him, the rest of her loved it that he worried. I'm okay, she told him before he bothered to ask. No, you're not, but I don't see how you could be. He looked around. Where's Lydia? Had some things to do. She's going to meet us at the station at noon so we can give them our statements. And then what? She shrugged. I'm going home. I'm going to go home, make some tapes of my voice for Stormy's mom to play for her. Gather up a few CDs in my programmable player and get it all set up her, in her room. Then I'm going to pack. Pack. I hate to leave Stormy Lou, but according to what I've been able to find out online, the Green Raider lives in Maine, and we really do need to talk to her. She's the only one we have right now besides Styles, and we can't find him. Okay, I'm going to have to stop. I'll read the rest of this in the next one, okay?